Good afternoon, good evening, and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Liviu Matei. I'm a professor of higher education and public policy at the School of Education, Communication, and Society, and currently serving as uh, head of, uh, of school. And I was asked to introduce this event, and I would like to thank all of you for being here with us in person and uh, online, starting, of course, with Maren and Christian. So uh, welcome and, 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 and thank you. By way of introduction, really, I would like to share a few thoughts inspired by the book, also about the book and some of the themes that are problematized in the book. And uh, this is in part based on a little bit of a personal experience. You know, uh, while coming, not, not while coming here, when I was first asked whether I would do this introduction, I was a little worried, you know, what was I going to talk about? And do we have a lot of enough material or do I have enough material to talk about it? And then um, it came to my mind a, a film that you might know uh, directed by Pedro Almodovar, a Spanish film director, which is about dreams and one dream after another. And while they are making the dream, the producer goes to Almodovar and says, we don't have enough material for the film. It's too short. It's going to be too short. And Almodovar says, don't worry, we add one more dream and another dream and we, we make the film as long as it takes. Well, there's no need for anything like that here because this book is very thick and it's not thick as an object. I don't want to say that. Uh, it's normal. It's not thick, not even in the sense of thick theory, but if you read it, and I do advise, it to, advise you to read it, buy it if you wish as well, uh, every sentence, every paragraph is full of substance, facts, references, analysis, analysis, criticism. So it's, it's remarkable. You have to read it basically with a pencil in your, in, in, in your, in your hand. So it, it is, there's a lot in this book. So you know, there's no reason for me to worry you know, what you will talk about all or what I, uh, I can talk about. Plus, you now Ellie, who will be chairing this, uh, this event, reminded me that I have only five minutes. So I consumed already two or three. So let me go back to a little bit of a personal experience and then go back to the, to, the, to the book. And I am saying this because what the book does, among other things, is to open new avenues for research and reflection and, and thinking in this area of uh, uh, transnational governance. So this is the personal experience. A few years ago, quite a few years ago, I was asked to do a study about a country analysis, if you wish, the implementation of a Bologna reforms in Armenia. I did it with a wonderful team. We did it, published the report. The Armenian government was extremely unhappy because we said it is fake. There's no reform. There is nothing. But more you know, dangerously, the World Bank was sued in Washington based on our report. No, it wasn't sued by us or by the government, by local Armenian NGOs for being complacent to corruption and embezzlement of uh, Armenian public money. Because they said, you know, you gave a loan, money went, there was a big program for uh, addressing these gender disparities, money loaned by the uh, World Bank but repaid by the Armenian taxpayer went into private pockets and nothing happened. So I'm, I'm saying this for different reasons, but one is to disclose, I have a little bit of a conflict of interest here, I have worked for all these three organizations. Not as an employee, but as a consultant for the World Bank, um, um, OECD and UNESCO. After this event, I have stayed in good terms with many friends, colleagues at the World Bank, never got an assignment any, anymore. But what is more interesting, and this is where I wanted to get, this study that we did was commissioned by a non-governmental organization, Open Society Foundation. The Open Society Foundation refused to be part of anything that was against the World Bank or that questioned what the World Bank was, uh, was doing. So they didn't support it as they left, that, left us in the air. And, and I'm saying this because one very interesting avenue of reflection of, and the research in this book is about the role of non-state actors in transnational uh, governance. And there is, there is a lot about that. And you know, I, I, I happen to, to have this, uh, this, uh, this experience. There's one other, and I'm jumping a little bit, I'm jumping fast. Uh, another idea I, um, I, I wanted to, 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 to mention here, uh, there is a lot of thinking, facts, analysis about how these organizations work. 
as a, as a matter of fact. And there is this legend uh, that the World Bank is also only influential in low income countries. But that's obviously not true. So for those of us who work in higher education, for example, when studying the Lisbon strategy of the European Union, you can find documents in the early 2000s that are copy pasted in the European Commission from older documents of the World Bank in Africa. For, for, so the World Bank until today exercises an influence beyond low income countries and beyond loans, financing, financial conditionalities in so many ways that uh, some, well, most of which are, are, are mentioned in this book that we, we, we normally, um, we normally not, do not discuss, like uh, you know, producing publications. The uh, volume about uh, uh, building knowledge societies that was uh, coordinated by Jalmit Salmi in 2004 became the Bible of knowledge society plus neoliberalism discourse in higher education policy everywhere in the world, including the United States. So that's, that's also, it's also fascinating to, to follow this uh, train of research and of, uh, of, um, of uh, thinking. So I'll mention one more thing and then I'll end with a challenge for, for all of you, for well, all of you, not for me. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is very interesting to see what is happening in the world in terms of transnational uh, governance, including close to home. I'm not sure whether what is called mainland Europe now is close to home here. I think, I think it is. Uh, for example, there is the project of European universities, uh, university alliances in, in uh, Europe. King's is member of such an alliance. And the official objective there is to create transnational universities, no less than that, including by creating the legal frameworks, not just the policy framework, for such universities to be registered, chartered not in national jurisdictions, but somewhere in the transnational sky. And we can ask, you know, we can go and study, where does it come from? What is the role of the World Bank? What is the role of OECD? Is there any role of, of, uh, of UNESCO? But I'm also saying this because one fascinating uh, you know, uh, facet of this book is looking historically at how transnational governance changes in education and also the, the understanding of, uh, of transnational governance. So, you know, I have a lot more uh, dreams, uh, seeds for dreams that I, I would be ready to, to, to discuss. And they are all uh, thoughts triggered by reading the book. But I, as I said, I want to, to end with a challenge. I was asked by the uh, journal um, International, Internationalization of Higher Education Policy and Practice to write a review about the, the book, which probably would be the first uh, review but uh, of this book, but I'm sure there are people who can do it better than me in the, in the room, so I, I want to challenge you. So if you, if you want to write it, please do it. Because, you know, this is, this is not only a fascinating book, but it is a, a must read for anybody interested in global governance, transnational governance, for anybody who wants to know about this organization, and most generally for anybody who works in higher education policy and in education policy more, more generally. So I'm sure we'll hear a lot more from the other uh, participants and from the authors themselves. So thank you very much. Thank you, Liv Yu. Hello, everybody. Let me add my welcome to everybody who's here in person and online today. My name's uh, Ellie Gurney. I work in the School of Education, Communication and Society as well here at King's. And it's my job to be your moderator this evening, which means I'm cracking the whip in terms of timekeeping and be handing the mic around later for all of your questions for our panelists. Uh, but my first job of the evening is to introduce our speakers today. And firstly, our two co-authors. Maren Elfert, a senior lecturer in international education here at King's College London and author of the book, in addition to Global Governance of Education, um, UNESCO's Utopia of Lifelong Learning and Intellectual History. She is the submissions editor of the International Review of Education and a member of the editorial board of Comparative Education. And she is joined online uh, by her co-author, Christian Edenson, who is a professor at Arborg University um, and an honorary research fellow at Oxford University. He's recently completed the research projects, The Global History of the OECD in Education and Education Access Under the Reign of Testing and Inclusion. 
He has been a visiting scholar at the University of Edinburgh, the University of Birmingham, the University of Oxford, and the University of Milan. And our two co-authors are joined by our two discussants, uh, Susan Robertson, a professor of sociology of education at the University of Cambridge, a fellow of Wolfson College, and distinguished professor at Aarhus University. She has written extensively on transformations of the state and education policy, globalization and global governance, and multilateralism. Susan is founding and current co-editor of the journal Globalization, Societies and Education. And finally, last but by no means least, we have Diogo Santori, a senior lecturer in education and society at King's College London. He served as a panel member for funding bodies such as UKRI, as board member of the British Journal of Sociology of Education, and for third sector organizations like Defend Digital Me. His new book, The Quantified School, Pedagogy, Subjectivity, and Metrics, which is out in December of this year, so please bookmark that, everybody, traces new linkages between educational policy and everyday life in schools, delving deeper into ordinary schools as they encounter and navigate quantified forms of recognition. So our running order for today, firstly, we'll be hearing from our two co-authors, Marin and Christian, and then we'll be handing over to Susan and Diego for discussion. And then it's over to everybody else in the room for some questions for our panel. So over to you, Marin. All right. Thank you very much, Ellie. I hope the mic works. OK, yeah. So uh, Christian uh, and I are delighted to launch the book today. Um, and thank you all very much for coming, Susan and Diego, of course, in particular, uh, and everybody else uh, for being here. Uh, we're very pleased about the positive feedback that we've gotten so far about the book. Um, and, uh, and I'm really delighted to present it to you today. So I'm going to go through the chapters of the book and then Christian is going to take over and present the main findings of the book. Um, so let me just change the slides. So we believe that, uh, that the book has, uh, provides two novel perspectives. Um, rather than treating uh, UNESCO, the OECD, and the World Bank separately, it examines the historical entanglements and relations between these uh, three organizations and how they struggled and competed over authority in the global governance space. Um, and the book pays clo uh, close attention to the historical trajectories, as both Christian and I are very historically minded, um, of educational ideas and tools and practices uh, that were employed by these three organizations up to the present time. And methodologically, the book draws on primary source materials collected in several archives around the world, uh, such as the uh, US National Archives, the Rockefeller Archive Center, uh, a national archive in Berlin, uh, and of course the UNESCO, OECD and World Bank archives, as well as also the, the Danish National Archives, as well as 40 interviews. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Xiaomin Li, uh, who helped us sort through all of these materials. So in terms of the rationale of the book, it was somewhat um, inspired uh, by uh, Jens Beckert's seminal paper uh, of, about the exhausted futures of neoliberalism, where he writes about the legitimacy that political authority gained from promising the future outcomes of neoliberalism, and that these promises have not come to pass. Uh, and in a similar vein, UNESCO, the OECD, and the World Bank have built their legitimacy on promising the achievement of a range of societal goals, such as productivity, economic growth, uh, education for all, a 21st century uh, skills, and so on. And it could be argued that they largely failed to deliver on these promises, but they have been successful in normalizing and globalizing educational discourses and policy agendas. There's also a lack of scholarly attention to the interrelations between international organizations. There is, of course, a lot of literature out there on all of these three organizations. But uh, as Kranke writes, the strive for uniqueness within spheres of overlapping authority makes the view that international organizations can be studied in isolation untenable. 
and of course the book has also some significant limitations. So because we focus on the, the big three, UNESCO, the OECD and the World Bank, we neglect other important organizations such as UNICEF for example or the, Euro the European Union and we also focus quite a lot on the US American dominance because the United States was instrumental in creating all of these organizations and in using these organizations. It was a bit more complicated with UNESCO. Um, but in any case, uh, this book is very much situated in this era of the, of, of the US American dominance. Um, also, uh, we don't pay enough attention to uh, micro perspectives in terms of how these global influences have played out at the local and national level, how, how they have been negotiated um, uh, and also resisted at, at the local and, and national levels. Okay, so chapter one um, is um, uh, introduces uh, the glo global governance pers uh, of education from a theoretical perspective. Um, and the perspective of global governance, uh, which was uh, coined, the term was coined by the book by Rosenau and Chempiel, Governance Without Government, emerged as a reaction to the limitations of the realist school of international relations with its focus on the centrality of national interests as the main driver of world order. Since the 1990s, realist theories seemed increasingly inadequate to explain the rising influence of non-state actors, technology, and the dynamics of globalization. And global governance has a non-hierarchical perspective in the sense that uh, a nation state could, have a, could be an equally powerful uh, actor as an international organization, for example. Um, there are, of course, actors of different sizes, and the size is not meant in, in, in physical terms, but in terms of the effects that actors have at the global level. Um, there is also a core, peri a core periphery pattern in the sense that some organizations uh, play a core role in conceptualizing certain uh, concepts such as lifelong learning, for example, and then these, these uh, uh, interpretations move to, to the periphery to, and are taken up by other international, smaller and newer uh, international organizations. We've also drawn on the concept of promissory legitimacy, which is also inspired uh, by Jens Beckert, because these organizations, they, they uh, uh, create legitimacy by promising uh, uh, future imaginaries, uh, by making promises for the future. And then we've uh, drawn on several um, uh, theoretical perspectives, such as the, uh, the constructivist, uh, neo-institutionalist perspective, which gained a lot of influence since the 1990s, where international organizations are considered as uh, autonomous actors that generate meanings and that uh, uh, develop bureaucracies uh, of, of their own. Um, and then we've also drawn on material, on more materialist theories on the global governance. Uh, and we were inspired by Nick Chinek's study. He's actually at King's uh, on the material construction of world politics. Because international organizations base their authority also very much on material in terms of measurable realities uh, through representational technologies such as statistics, uh, international large-scale assessment surveys, management tools, indicators, etc. And then we also take a political economy perspective uh, as we are also interested in the transnational role of these international organizations in promoting capitalism. Uh, for example, um, Paul Kamak's book on the OECD uh, uh, focuses on the OECD as an organization that promotes the politics of competitiveness. We just have the glasses. Okay, chapter two. Chapter two provides an overview of the educational activities and the um, epistemic and ontological underpinnings of UNESCO, the OECD, and the World Bank. 
from a global governance perspective. And we conceptualize uh, UNESCO in this chapter as the idealist because UNESCO governs through norm setting, uh, such as room, uh, human rights frameworks, declarations, resolutions, uh, also through the coordination of global development agendas, such as Education for All, uh, or now the uh, Sustainable Development Goal 4. And UNESCO has more of a humanistic uh, and human rights perspective uh, on education. And we conceptualize the OECD as the master of persuasion, because the OECD derives its authority from the generation of expert knowledge and research and exerts soft power uh, through the use of indicators, benchmark, and comparative rankings that exert uh, a peer pressure. Um, and the World Bank is uh, conceptualized as the master of coercion uh, because the World Bank's policy influence is financially driven and funding contracts with loan receiving countries are tied to conditions and to policy menus and the uh, structural adjustment programs of the neoliberal era are an example of that. And chapter three delves into the early years of educational planning in developing countries and analyzes the connections and turf struggles between UNESCO and the OECD, as well as the rise of the international expert in the production and legit leg legitimation of knowledge claims that came to underpin the global governance of education. And the chapter has a focus on the influence of the United States and shows how the intersections between international organizations, the US government, philanthropic foundations, and universities formed a powerful network of influence that spread the gospel of modernization. And chapter four focuses on the turf struggles between UNESCO and the World Bank uh, over the field of education for development. And this chapter has two sections. The first uh, covers the cooperative program between the two organizations, uh, which was launched in the early 1960s when the World Bank started giving educational loans and had no expertise in education and therefore collaborated with UNESCO. Um, and this section draws heavily on a paper, an article that was already published in the International Journal of um, Educational Development. Um, and the, the, what's interesting about this story is that during this period when the two organizations worked together, the World Bank built its own resources and its own staff and overtook UNESCO as the main policy shaper in low-income countries. And then the second section of, the, of this chapter focuses on the Education for All movement, which was launched in 1990, and where these two uh, uh, organizations and others have have worked together again, or continued to work together in a way. Um, chapter five um, sheds light on the collaboration and competition between UNESCO, the OECD, and the World Bank with regard to educational statistics, which became a key tool of the global governance of education. And chapter six provides a critical analysis of the OECD's and UNESCO's engagement with lifelong learning as a policy concept. Uh, the chapter demonstrates how in the context of the economic crisis and change of the political climate in the second half of the 1970s and the 1980s, the progressive lifelong learning movement was crowded out by the pursuit of education indicators and the measurement of skills from which the OECD's PISA study emerged. So chapter seven represents an analysis of UNESCO, the OECD, and the World Bank as a social network and traces the biographies and influence of key people working in these organizations. And if you have a look at this diagram, you can see that um, there are these, these fields 
um, that the World Bank, the OECD, and UNESCO, and they have overlapping fields. And so in these overlapping fields, uh, uh, people have, sometimes people have worked in two or three of these organizations, or they have been involved with some initiatives or reports or committees or something like that in, in, in the other organizations. Some of these people are also among our interviewees. Um, and what's interesting is that, uh, that there are some, so for example, the International Institute for Educational Planning, the IIEP, which is somewhere here around this gray area, uh, uh, emerged as a, a, a space of intense boundary work where all three organizations uh, uh, co co uh, worked together. Uh, we can also see a Western dominance, uh, lots of Western names. Uh, it's, it, it looks a little bit more diverse in, in the UNESCO field, um, especially in OECD and the World Bank. Uh, and, uh, and of course, also the lack of women, uh, uh, except for Lucilla Jalad, who we also interviewed, who, who uh, yeah, um, stood the ground among all of these men, uh, an educational planner. Um, and uh, the chapter explores three case arenas, uh, as we call them, um, between the 1960s to the present day. And the first case arena uh, focuses on the creation of the International Institute for Educational Planning, the IIEP, which was created in 1963 as an institute of UNESCO. And then the second uh, case uh, traces the travels and correspondence of Mats Hultin, uh, who was uh, a former head of department at the Swedish Ministry of Education and then a World Bank staffer between 1965 and 1984. And the third case explores uh, the role of Andreas Schleicher, the PISA director in the formation of the OECD's indicators and PISA complex. And chapter eight uh, is, is the concluding chapter and reiterates and ties together the key arguments from the previous chapters and relates them to the contemporary developments and initiatives pursued by the OECD, the World Bank, and UNESCO um, today. And the chapter also addresses shifts in the global governance of education, in particular the rising influence of corporate actors and philanthropic foundations, uh, in these uh, uh, three organizations, and the shift from multilateralism to multi-stakeholderism that Christian is going to talk a little bit more about. And finally, we offer some speculative reflections on, uh, on the future trajectories, dynamics, and agendas of the global governance of education. For example, the rising influence of China. Um, okay, so this was my part, and now I'm going to give the floor to Christian Edison, who is online, and who will present the main findings of the book. Thank you very much, Maren. Um, is the sound good? Yes, Do you hear? sound is good. Yeah, good, good. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll present uh, the findings. Um, if you change the slide. Yeah, so one of the key findings of our research is that UNESCO was crowded out by the expansion of the OECD and the World Bank. Uh, in that regard, it's important to note that UNESCO was created as the specialized agency of the United Nations for intellectual affairs, including education, which gives the organization a great deal of legitimacy. It's also the most democratically governed international organization and the one in which developing countries have the most say. So during the 60s, UNESCO was challenged by the OECD, which positioned itself as a key expert in the new economics of education approach in charge of productivity and economic growth in the industrialized countries, while UNESCO was left with the field of development. If we move to the 1970s, UNESCO's position as the leading authority for education in developing countries was then challenged by the World Bank. Uh, but still, UNESCO played an important role as a forum of dialogue during the Cold War, but lost significant influence after the fall of the Berlin Wall. But for reasons of the legitimacy, UNESCO continues to be a major actor in the global governance of education, 
because the organization is formally in charge of coordinating the sustainable development goal for agenda. But its autonomy has been jeopardized by the economization of education and by the constraints of tight money, so to speak. A second finding is that um, the United States used the OECD and the World Bank to pursue its national and geopolitical interests and secure its dominant position in the world. The OECD, which was originally created to administer the Marshall Plan on behalf of the US government, was used to spreading the American productivity saga. The World Bank was a chosen instrument of the US government to expand the American project of free market capitalism to developing countries. Considered increasingly a difficult and unreliable partner, the United States lost its interest in UNESCO, which furthered the rise of the OECD and the World Bank. The departure of the United States in 1984 from UNESCO not only weakened the organization financially, but also contributed to positioning the OECD to take the lead of the indicators movement that would eventually yield PISA. But also, it's important to note that less powerful and middle power states have actually interacted with the international organizations to pursue national priority agendas, as illustrated by the Swedish role in the OECD series recurrent education program. A contemporary example of how international organizations are entangled in national and geopolitical interests is the strategic participation of selective provinces of China and the emergence of Shanghai as the new PISA poster child. China is also increasingly gaining influence in UNESCO, filling the void left by the withdrawal of the United States from the organization, although the US has now rejoined the organization. So the third finding, the role of global agendas, a key instrument of the global governance of education are global targets that aim at uniting all relevant actors behind a supposedly universal agenda of critical significance. The UNESCO-led SDG4 framework is providing the impetus for the OECD to expand its testing empire and the World Bank to implement its outcome-oriented ideology, agendas that are counter to UNESCO's philosophy. Both the World Bank and the OECD are promoting assessment for all under the SDG banner, recast as a public good and human right. What's new in the context of SDG 4 is that the OECD shifted its position from the margins to the center of the network involved with delivering SDG 4. With financial support from the World Bank, the OECD is currently expanding into low and middle income countries. So the SDG 4 essentially constitutes a self-serving agenda for international organizations and the development industry and benefits corporate interests over the interests of low-income countries that the global agenda is allegedly serving. Universal technical solutions potentially disempower countries. So one of the ways that international organizations and other actors of global governance legitimize their existence is by building up supposedly superior technical and bureaucratic expertise that remains unquestioned as it's difficult to understand. And while countries are involved in the global governance bodies, it's the experts that take the lead. The fourth finding about boundaries. Well, we have employed the concept of boundary work in the book. So this boundary work was often enabled by independent third party structures, such as, the, such as the OECD's Center for Educational Research and Innovation and UNESCO's Institute for um, International uh, Education Planning, allowing for indirect boundary work between the international organizations. So the IIEP plays a particularly important role in UNESCO's boundary work. It represents an organization that's somewhat outside of the ideological field of UNESCO and similar to the professional ethos of the World Bank. Siri is also a good example of demarcation within an organization as its creation enabled more progressive and innovative initiatives that would have been difficult to realize in the context of the core of the OECD. These boundary structures cause a lot of tension though between the core organization and the subsidiary body. Other spaces for boundary work are the UNESCO Institute of Statistics, which formerly holds the coordinating role for monitoring the SDG4, and the networks of policy influence that span across organizations like multi-stakeholder groups, governing bodies, international conferences. 
the fifth finding um, in the name of universal goals, such as education for all, and now also assessment for all, international organizations are in the business of self-preservation and perpetual expansionism. The history of the UNESCO World Bank Cooperative Program illustrates the bank's uh, expansionist, homogenizing, and isomorphic tendencies. These tendencies are also visible in the evolution of the OECD that has constantly reinvented itself in order to find new er areas of activity and legitimacy. Global agendas display matrix-like effects by putting forward a common sense discourse, such as the imperatives of quality, transparency, and accountability, that contribute to the homogenization of global education. Our analysis casts doubt on the discourse of country ownership, for instance, the process that led to the Millennium Development Goals and the Education for All governance structure. So the sixth finding are about the shifts in the global governance of education from multilateral governance to multi-stakeholder governance. So in multilateralism, Governments, as representatives of their citizens, take decisions on global issues and direct international organizations to implement these decisions. Whereas in multi-stakeholderism, stakeholders become the central actors. Decisions are often disconnected from the intergovernmental sphere. While the multi-stakeholder governor may cite a multilateral goal that it asserts as it's implementing on behalf of governments and uh, a multi-stakeholder governor has no obligation to report its activities to or to take instructions from the intergovernmental community. An example of powerful multi-stakeholder organization is the Global Partnership for Education. So we also see a growing influence of corporate actors and philanthropic foundations in international organizations. So many questions arise from our analysis. Would we be in a better place today if there had been less mission creep among the, uh, oh, it's okay to go to the next slide, the final slide. Um, would there have been, uh, would we be in a better place today if there had been less mission creep among the international organizations and UNESCO's role had not been continuously eroded? The competition between the three IOs had an isomorphic effect that has blurred the differences between them. They are in fact all governed by similar technocratic practices and epistemic underpinnings, such as results-based management. Another question that arises is, where does it leave these global organizations when the nature of globalization changes? If two of the international organizations discussed in this, books, in this book were instruments of American hegemony, what is their future going to be in the world in which other countries, such as China, are emerging as dominant powers and a world which is governed by transnational corporate digital power structures? As global agendas such as the SDG4 are granted universal global authority, powerful actors aim to define them. We would therefore argue that we need to keep up a critical research agenda on the struggles over who gets to move into global governance spaces, what agendas are being promoted, and who do they serve. We also need to pay close attention to voices and initiatives that resist the hegemonic, expansionist, and self-serving characteristics of the current system of global governance of education. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll give the word back to Meryn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Maren. Thank you, Christian. And all I have to do is hand the floor over to Susan for um, her response. So, Thank you so much. What a, a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you to all of you who've come here this evening um, to actually uh, celebrate a book. Um, I've, as a, a long time um, writer on globalization and an observer of uh, global governance, um, you're often very dismayed actually when the reference to global processes and particularly global institutions goes something like this. It's the IMF, World Bank, OECD. Stick them all together and they're all the bad ones. Um, and in fact, actually, the, these institutions are quite different. They're doing rather different things. And if we look at these institutions and we open up these institutions, uh, UNESCO, for example, is made up of education and culture. The two bits often don't talk to each other. If you go into the uh, OECD, there's a very um, 
healthy debate. Um, and that was, you know, began in the 1960s about the limits to growth. So on the one hand, you had the economists of education um, and so on, the statisticians pushing quite hard for uh, modernization and so on. But there are other elements of the OECD, for instance, that were actually drawing our attention constantly to um, a different development model. Um, and we, we could also say the same thing about the, the World Bank, and that is that actually the education part of the World Bank is actually dominated by economists of education. But we can actually see sometimes more progressive bits of these institutions. Um, so I just want to start with that reflection around the importance of um, the kind of work that you've done. It's fabulous. It's a, I've, I've, it's a tour de force. And uh, as the, um, uh, it was, uh, the opening remarks kind of made it very clear, um, you are concentrating the whole time on uh, the kind of evidence that's being presented um, and so on. So it is my great pleasure to... Um, read the book, but also to comment on it this evening. But actually, I also want to step back personally and, and kind of try not to think about these global institutions as only operating up in the global stratosphere. Um, these are institutions that are placed, they have effects on places, um, and they, they find their way, their various programs, uh, with more or less kind of power and influence um, in country spaces. And it was my first encounter, actually, with the OECD while I was, I was a research officer in the research division of the Department for Education in Western Australia in the early 1980s. And I had been seconded to undertake research on youth unemployment, which at that time was about 35%, school-to-work transitions. And this was more or less set against the Keynesian crisis of the 1970s. Um, but more importantly, too, um, the kind of work that we we're actually doing was actually trying to shore up some of the challenges that countries like Australia, UK, America, and, and New Zealand actually faced with the process of deindustrialization. Now, the project I was working on uh, was a federal government endorsed OECD project on decentralization of education and local development. And I remember thinking, huh, this is odd, um, because education in Australia is constitutionally located in the subnational arena. So the constitutions, because Australia is a federation, and education, when uh, the federal government gets involved, even now, um, it more or less gets involved on the basis of its own constitutional responsibilities around marginalised groups, gender, uh, indigenous, multiculturalism, and so on. And after the Korean War, it took on um, higher education. Um, so there's interesting kind of skirmishes that happen within national territorial spaces um, around where responsibilities might actually lie. So this was the federal government, and this is how the OECD would push in their programming, and it would then go from the federal government and down into and, and a, a state, national state, uh, one of the subnational states might make a decision to take it on or not. Um, and this was fundamentally what I then came to recognise as the early days of new public management in the early 1980s. Um, we worked on uh, various projects then for the OECD, but always then too using the epistemic knowledge that was being pushed by the OECD. Um, and Australia actually has a very special um, and, and quite um, formative role in shaping the OECD. Uh, named individuals like Barry McGaw, who would have gone from Australia from the ACR um, outfit that was the federal outfit um, but was funded by Kellogg money from the United States into Australia, similar kind of money into New Zealand. So uh, as the US had very long arms into these, these spaces. Um, but what, was, what, was the, what these projects were fundamentally doing was really trying to drive, um, drive out centralisation and insert community-based development, uh, but not in a progressive way because there was a kind of tightening up of the reins of certain kinds of powers in the centre and certain kinds of responsibilities being pushed downward. And again, many of us have actually written ab about those things. Um, 
my own PhD work then uh, in, at the end of the 1980s would recognise very influential uh, politicians, for example, John Dawkins, who would be um, then using the OECD to actually push forward federal initiatives so this is scale jumping uh, in Chris Collins' kind of uh, language that would then find their way, they'd boomerang down and into subnational spaces. And, and these international organisations do a lot of this kind of work. So you can see what you start to need is more than the nasty people over there, IMF, World Bank, OECD, but actually tracing the ways in which ideas get moved up and down and the politics of these rescalings that are taking place. So that was the first one. But it was the, uh, and I found, I took up a post in New Zealand in the mid 1990s, and this would bring me face to face with what Jane Kelsey, an intellectual there at the time, described as economic fundamentalism, an overnight shock tactic to insert Hayekian economics into the organisation of New Zealand's economy and public sectors. So developed uh, country, but fundamentally, this was the World Bank project, fundamentally. Um, and Jane would actually describe it, uh, so we have uh, public choice, principal agent theory, um, and it was fundamentally the so-called Chicago Boys, World Bank-inspired agenda that paralleled the, the agenda that was inserted into Chile. So almost overnight, all unions were abolished. The only two unions that remained in New Zealand were the teachers' unions, higher education and, and, and the school teacher unions. Schools were placed in competition with each other. Each school had an individual contract with the minister and performance was measured via outputs and outcomes, the kinds of statistics and uh, epistemic expert that was driving um, in th these institutions. Um, but this is, this is the bank in New Zealand, fundamentally. So uh, it does reach down and into spaces uh, in ways in which we don't always recognise. Now, I mention these two examples as illustrators of the work that may or may not take place from these global institutions deep inside national systems to enable Hall, um, who describes these as third order changes. So these are big paradigm shifts. Um, and I just want to add the OECD, for example, was the secretariat to the Trilateral Commission. So the Trilateral Commission, very powerful in the United States, uh, pushing forward um, the um, as what we've come to recognise as the neoliberal agenda and, and advancing US hegemony. Now, it was Philip Jones, and this is a long time, so your book actually now sits uh, on the shelf beside the work of Philip Jones, who did most of this kind of um, global writing of the multilateral institutions in the late 1980s and early 1990s. His book came out in 1992, um, the one that um, was to be quite influential. So this is a long time, in my view, coming um, to really get something else on the table that uh, enables us to see the entanglements, as it's described, the, uh, the shifting agendas of what I've elsewhere called these guardians of the future. Um, and my view here essentially is that um, though Philip talked about the determining effect of the global governance agendas, my own view is that the degrees of determination are their empirical issues. And I would want to say at the moment, I think, the OECD is kind of uh, somewhat shaken. It's uh, recent uh, programming uh, and pr initiatives around global competences have not gone well. It's moved into the culture territory. It's never gone there. UNESCO got deeply burnt because it engaged with this, uh, and the OECD is backed right out quite quickly. Um, the data that was collected around the global competences is really poor data, no one can use it. They took a year to actually announce this data, um, and so on. And I would also want to add that essentially, um, you know, UNESCO, um, it's just being funded by the US again, but China's a, a huge funder of UNESCO. And if you're in China, there's a lot of talk about the importance of um, engaging with the global, what they mean is UNESCO. Um, it was always accused of being the harbinger of, um, of uh, anti-USA politics and the CIA were all over um, uh, UNESCO, particularly through the 1950s. Um, 
Um, what I also would want to say is that uh, UNESCO often does get wheeled in to be the front institution when things get really dodgy and difficult, and the the bank can't do it because the bank is actually um, you know, facing its own kinds of challenges. So it kind of gets moved into the driving seat as it's done with, with the SDG um, 4. Um, the, the bank itself has often faced um, huge challenges around legitimacy, the disastrous uh, structural adjustment programs that it, it, uh, it pushed in the 1980s. It tried to recover a position around the turn to good governance in the 1990s. But many countries actually uh, pulled out, didn't want bank money. And the bank needs interest because it's a bank. Um, and so countries are saying, wow, no, we're not having you, um, is a is an issue, and Nairi Woods, who's at Oxford, writes a lot on global governance, would actually point to the issues, the challenges, when the bank and the IMF have not um, been able to um, push forward their agenda in quite the same way. What the bank has done, and it's a bank group, so there are other institutions as part of the bank. It's used the International Finance Corporation when countries have stopped, uh, sovereign states stopped lend, you know, taking money. And it's, sought, it's gone into funding private actors to advance its privatisation agenda. And as I just said, the OECD's navigation into the heady uh, winds of culture most recently have seen it being blown off course and sh facing shortfalls in both promissory legitimacy and credibility. So after more than three decades of its own extraordinary expansion, the, the really important and interesting issues, wonderful projects for doctoral students here, um, is you know, how, how is it going to work out? What's actually going to happen uh, here? And so to this book, it is, as I said, the first major undertaking of any substantial engagement with the big three, the bank, the OECD and UNESCO, since Philip Jones's work. And this is not to say that the amount of work out there has been slim pickings. It is not, quite the opposite. But there's, um, there's been a serious amount of work on global governance, but we've, I, it's what I describe as getting the needle stuck on some bits of the bank, um, but particularly the OECD and its PISA project. Um, and much as though this is interesting, it's also been stuck on this governing by numbers um, kind of trope. And there is so much more to both explore, say, and um, you know, theoretically engage with than that. Because through all this period of time, what we've seen is um, the, as, as the book beautifully describes it, the rescaling both horizontally and vertically to bring in uh, many more institutions. Um, but now we've got the big tech firms kind of sitting on our shoulder as well. Um, and the danger of actually that focus on the OECD like that is that it's tended to amplify the power of the OECD, when often if you, and I've got my own students have done these tracings through, you know, the bank, the OECD says, well, it, it makes a difference for teachers in classrooms. Go to Mexico and Israel Moreno will actually tell you, the Mexican teachers have no clue, you know, despite the fact there's huge amounts of money that the Mexican government is putting into translating some of this stuff for teachers in classrooms. So this book, is uh, it, 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 uh, it engages beautifully with the ongoing struggles, shortfalls, differences between synergies across and mutually agreed alignments across these agencies. It's a tour de force, as I said, and it benefits from the most amazing archival work, uh, interviews, attentiveness to theorising of what's taking place, historicising the institutions and the ongoing struggles and, and, and strategies at the level of agents, actors, institutions and nations. It sheds light on the ongoing entanglements of these and, of course, some things disappear in that process. Um, for instance, the, uh, the European Commission maintains an OECD desk in the commission, um, and one of our colleagues, Tor Sorensen, uh, sitting in that desk actually was handling the TALIS, which is the Teaching and Learning International Survey, in the commission. I've been in many of the uh, European uh, Commission uh, events, ministerials, education ministerials, and the OECD is often the uh, they're often chairing the seminars. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I didn't expect you to be here, OECD, in a European event quite that way. Um, so like all, and this is my final remarks, it, it sets up an agenda, uh, 
as an outstanding book, which can be taken by researchers to deepen our understanding of global governance and develop global studies. And I am going to push the idea of global studies. I think it's different. It's different from comparative and international. It's, it, 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 it's got a different spatial analytic. And in that sense, um, I, I see it as contributing not simply to the global governance of education, but many um, of our colleagues who are working on global governance in other cognate fields, IR, um, international political economy and so on, will value significantly this book. And that's great praise um, to have, have that said about the book. It's attention to the knowledge society, for example. Um, I would want to say there's a lot more work that could be done into the future thinking about new agendas um, around the knowledge economy, the alignments between the bank and its knowledge for development, the World Trade Organization, GATS, uh, the mega trade agreements. Um, these are stories that are not in this book and it can't, they can't be in this book because otherwise um, the book would never uh, be completed and be a, a monster book. But I do see another book around the corner for you. <laughs> there. Um, and what are the rise of China and the emergence of new institutions of governance that carry China's agenda, its own bank, uh, its, um, its disappointment at being excluded from the, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, its rolling out of the, the Belt and Road and so on. All of these are really important um, a kind, of, a, a kind of developments that are actually taking place. So in conclusion, I want to congratulate you. Um, Marin and Christian, and I've no doubt this this book will actually now become the classic um, on global governance and education, and it will be viewed by theorists of global governance more generally as adding to the overall stock of knowledge on the global governing um, of education, but global governance um, more generally. So really, I just want to say congratulations um, and celebrations, and it's so wonderful to see the book out. Thank you so much. Um, and now our final discussant, Diego. Um, well, um, thank you very much um, for inviting me um, to share my thoughts and um, appreciation of this book. Um, the good news is I'm kind of the last obstacle between us and the drinks. Uh, so um, we're getting there. Um, so um, yes, thank you very much, uh, Marin and Christian, for inviting me to discuss this wonderful book and join you in a journey of discovery through international organizations in education. Somehow I felt that you walked me um, through the corridors of these icons and introduced me to key people while helping me make sense of their views, agendas, and interests. I approach this book as a discourse analyst, and so my interest is in the construction of meaning and how it relates to broader social, political, and historical context. So as we know, the book is about the entanglements of three organizations, UNESCO, the World Bank, and the OECD. Um, as I was trying to detach myself from this intricate web of relationships, dilemmas and tensions, the first thing that came to mind is images of other trios um, and the complex relationships involved. And so the first one, you might laugh, but is um, the three little pigs. And I was thinking, okay, we have this third brother as wise, hardworking, and serious, while his two brothers are portrayed as naive and lazy. And this is a good illustration of how Mutual needs, aims, and individual characteristics come together and develop as frustration, jealousy, or collaboration. Trios are characterized by demarcated roles, each with their own personalities, goals, character uh, arcs, and their relationship characterized by both conflict and solidarity as they bounce off each other and work together. Marin and Christian have carefully chosen words to characterize the relationship between UNESCO, the World Bank, and the OECD. So I thought it would be interesting and to pay attention to those words that they've chosen. Um, they talk about turbulence, which we can understand as a violent or unsteady movement, a state of conflict or, or confusion. They talk about scramble, 
which we can understand as a difficult or hurried clamber upon or over something. And struggle, understood as a forceful or violent effort to get free of restraint or resist an attack. So clearly, this is not a boring relationship that they are exploring. Um, so why do we need to understand the relationship between these three organizations? And perhaps more importantly, what is at stake here? Um, so in my attempt to make sense of this overwhelming complexity, and if you had a chance to look at the book, there are hundreds of thousands of references and quotes. And so how, in my attempt to make sense of this overwhelming complexity, I ran to my comfort zone, which for me is the work of Michel Foucault. And so as uh, Gaventa notes, Foucault's uh, work marks a radical departure from previous modes of conceiving power and cannot be easily integrated with previous ideas as power is diffused rather than concentrated, embodied and enacted rather than possessed, discursive rather than purely coercive, and constitutes agents rather than being deployed by them. Each society, Foucault notes, has its regime of truth, its general politics of truth. That is the types of discourse uh, which accepts and makes function as true, the mechanisms and instances which enable one to distinguish true and false statements. The means by which each is sanctioned, the techniques and procedures accorded value in the acquisition of, of truth, the status of those who are charged with saying what counts as true. So um, the battle for truth is not for some absolute truth that can be discovered and accepted, but it's a battle about the rules according to which the true and the false are separated and specific effects of power are, atta are attached to the, to the truth. So how does this battle for truth look like in the context of international organizations. Chapter four, which I really enjoyed, um, the struggle between UNESCO and the World Bank over education for development could be a good place to explore and re reflect upon the complex relationship between uh, the World Bank and UNESCO. Page 80 reads, the marriage, and I highlight the word, between these two organizations was not an easy one as they represented very different logics of governance and were bound to different constitutional requirements. UNESCO's education sector was staffed predominantly with educators and philosophers and directed by ministers of education, culture and science. The World Bank's staff consisted mainly of economists and the organization was directed by ministers of finance. UNESCO's work was underpinned by approaches from the humanities and broader social sciences, while the, world, while the World Bank was guided by the expanding but narrower field of economics. You may, ha you may have noted that the authors um, use the word marriage to describe the contractual, contractual relationship between UNESCO and the World Bank through this cooperation program that they had. Um, I thought it would be helpful to borrow the notion of couple feet from couple therapy. My partner is a couple therapist to my disadvantage, so I, I, I usually learn new concepts uh, about that inform my behavior as well. Um, to think about the underlying reasons of this union. In the case of the union between UNESCO and the World Bank, the former had the mandate and norm setting power, while the latter had the funding and delivery power. The authors use the term turf battles to describe the ideolo ideological tensions at the heart of this relationship. Indeed, a few times UNESCO's actions in relation to the uh, cooperative program are described in the book as desperate. Page 84 reads, the bank expanded its educational lending program, built resources and expertise, and the cooperation with UNESCO from the perspective of the bank became more and more of a straitjacket. UNESCO desperately, I highlight the word, uh, tried to remind the bank of its mandate in education, but the bank displayed a ever greater self-confidence in dismissing UNESCO's claim to be the main authority for education. So clearly, this very much looks like a couple, and you know, 
Um, many of you will have been through some, some of those tensions. Um, indeed, the authors note that in the 80s, the relationship between the World Bank and UNESCO has uh, turned sore and described the tone of correspondence as reserved and frosty. Far from the aura of objectivity and impartiality imprinted in their reports and declarations, by having a closer look at their interactions and struggles, we gain a deeper understanding of international organizations as humane, temperamental, messy, and relational organizations. This is nicely captured in their account of the Education for All Forum. And on page 1993, the book reads, um, at the first post jumpton uh, meeting organized by the EFA Forum, held in 1991 in Paris, coordination and progress monitoring were explicitly included in the mandate of the forum, although it was unclear how monitoring should be done and there was no capacity in place for this task. So, wrapping up, uh, this is a fascinating analysis of the entanglement um, of, two, uh, of three high profile uh, international organizations and suggests the impossibility of separating out policy actors from the organizations and spaces they inhabit and thus the need to bring them into the picture when doing policy analysis, as Marin and Christian uh, do in the book. This battle to delineate the rules, such as the narrow focus on return on, on investments, the mechanisms, such as the, uh, the use of poverty reduction strategy papers, to determine the truth about educational systems, their reach, quality, efficiency, etc., suggest the need for these organizations to question and reimagining the wrong politics of truth. Congratulations, Marin and Christian, um, for what is a rigorous and engaging account of the backstage of global governance in education. Following on from this very exciting tour um, over the years uh, on how these three organizations um, have worked together and against each other, um, I have two questions uh, for Marin and Christian, one looking back and another one looking forward. Um, so the first one is, could UNESCO have avoided the marriage of convenience with the World Bank through this cooperative program in order to maintain or reaffirm its values and principles? And what can we learn from that? And the second question, looking forward, there are several accounts in the, books, in the book that portray the complex relationship between the World Bank, UNESCO, and the OECD as lacking care for national policies, agendas, and practices. For instance, there is reference to how bilateral agencies such as DFID objected to the World Bank's fast-track initiative as they saw it as a centralized initiative which would undermine local decision-making. So my question is, is there any hope in a shift towards participatory forms of support and development that has local values interests and agendas as a starting point for thinking policy change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diego. Um, and now I want to invite Marin and Christian to give a few sort of brief remarks just in response to um, Susan and Diego and perhaps could start with those questions that Diego um, posed. Yeah, that's a good idea, Ali. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Susan and Diego, for your kind remarks and, and really uh, very interesting and inspiring remarks. Um, Diego, I want to say to you, so first the questions. So the question about the cooperative agreement, um, it was at the time, it was a strategic move by uh, the Director General of UNESCO, René Maheu, to, 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 to enter in this relationship. Um, because uh, UNESCO was in trouble and had problems with another partner at the time, uh, the UNDP, United Nations Development Program, and needed a, and it was good to have another powerful funder. Uh, uh, so that was strategically ben beneficial. And UNESCO also, many would argue, UNESCO gained a lot of know-how from this relationship. 
Um, and there were two camps in UNESCO. Uh, one camp was absolutely against this relationship, like saw it as an as a as a as an alien body, uh, and, um, and and as an American influence and so on. And the other uh, camp thought that this technical sector, uh, this this technical sector work that 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 UNESCO carried out for for the World Bank, needed to be expanded in UNESCO actually and shouldn't have been abolished. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure whether things would have developed differently um, if UNESCO had not agreed to form this cooperation. And some argue that after the cooperative program finished, terminated, that UNESCO was deprofessionalized, that, you know, because this know-how was, was, was uh, de yeah, declined. And then the other thing about um, the, the, uh, the, you ask about the the, the centralized and top-down nature of these, you know, and whether the local can be um, emphasized. And I think that is a great question. Um, and we point that out in the book as well, because despite the rhetoric of country ownership, uh, there many of these initiatives are actually, when you look at the the, the, the background and the context, they are, they, they, they are quite centralized. And for example, the Fast Track Initiative um, in fact, was criticized for being top down and too much, too World Bank dominated, and then became the, the Global Partnership for Education. Um, and also, the uh, Sustainable Development Goal 4 consultations were made much more democratic. Uh, in response to this, to these critiques, and it was emphasized that countries and civil society organizations would be part of the consultation process. However, um, there is a speed and level of technicality um, of the discussions that disempowers many many actors. Although even if they are at the table, because it's the experts that kind of that kind of run the show, and also the poverty reduction strategy plans that are needed by countries to to receive World Bank loans, they're they're very often actually written by consultants because they have the know the know how to write them right. Um, so I also li uh, really liked um, your attention to 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 the uh, organizations as living beings um, and your also your references to Foucault and your points about the battle for truth um, and and this is also what Christian said that as these global agendas are granted universal global authority powerful actors also try to define them right um, and uh, so in terms I don't want to talk too long and uh, for Susan I thought it was fascinating to hear about your OECD experiences and also interesting to think about why some countries are more susceptible to OECD influence than, than others. And as you say, it's an empirical, right? It's, it needs to be, it, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less and so on. Um, and you are, of course, right about the important perspectives that are missing, such as the OECD European Union relationship would also be interesting uh, uh, to to research about the uh, um, UNESCO European relationship because UNESCO also actually also lost out against the European Union because the European Union took this European policy space um, and um, and I'm and I'm very excited by what you said about research agendas opening up and I think that there is as as you say there is a lot more that needs to be researched. Uh, also about the loss of legitimacy that you were also talking about that we see now, like PISA fatigue and and things like that. Um, and uh, also the, the connections of education to these trade agreements that I realized, for example, that the students often don't know much about. Um, and the rise of China and, 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 and how will the, the tense relationship between China and the United States play out now in UNESCO as, as you, the U United States have rejoined with the, actually get, with the rationale that they want to counter uh, China, Chinese influence and lots of other things. So let's, yeah, let's uh, get, give the floor to Christian as well. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for these great comments and, and, and questions. I'll only be, be brief. I mean, uh, Marin already talked about how UNESCO was uh, always underfinanced. Uh, it was a key reason behind the second director general, Torres Baudet, resigning from the post in 52. So I, I would just say that the marriage of convenience was driven by financial necessity, which is always problematic. Also in terms of couple fit, as you said, Diego. Um, 
And you raised also that question about the future. So given the geopolitical shifts, putting the global south more in the center of global developments, I think there's no way around for international organizations to pay more attention to other values, interests, and agendas if they are to reinvent themselves and stay in the game of global governance. This is among other places also reflected in the global campaign the South also knows, launched by NORAC recently. But the question remains about the local values, as you actually asked about, the local values, interests, and agendas. And I think there's a danger that one colonizing regime may be exchanged by another one using the architecture of international organizations in their present or reinvented form. So in that sense, we might be witnessing a struggle between China and the United States within the walls of UNESCO, as we also pointed out in our presentation. And for Susan, yeah, I was also intrigued by your Australian experience. I, I just want to add, uh, you know, something about the struggle there that went on. You rightly pointed out how ASA, the Australian Council for Educational Research, has been very closely tied and connected with with um, with the OECD. But but it's interesting that back in '76 they established a study group on national assessment on educational progress, and that study group actually ended its work in uh, 78 and the final recommendations were not in favor of introducing standardized testing in Australia. But nevertheless, the critical voices of this ASA study group were not heard nor even considered and they didn't have an impact on the development. So the OECD and the United States actually pulled in a different directions and the Australia, as I understand it, sort of more or less implemented the American National Assessment for Educational Progress program. Also, you're right in pointing out the omissions of the book, and clearly the OECD, EC, European Commission relationship is, is one. Um, as other research has shown, and you also mentioned, there's a clear historical pattern of a, of a rapprochement between these two organizations, which seem in many ways to be hinging on a realization of the, the mutual benefits associated with the collaboration enjoyed by both the organizations. So... Um, it's true that uh, the OECD European Commission relationship is relevant for global governance in the sense that the tools and the objectives of global governance often have been developed and pushed from the European arena and then extrapolated to the world, like, for instance, the Mediterranean regional program back in the 60s. But our focus in the book has been on the global workings of global governance, and one could argue that the European Commission OECD relationship has also been very much about crafting a European education space and perhaps also promoting a process of Europeanization through common infrastructural standards and assessment methodologies and, and measurement uh, technologies. So just a few reflections from your comments, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Marin and Christian. And now the time comes for us to turn over um, to everybody in the audience. Um, been listening very carefully and I'm sure have lots of questions. Um, I think we should go to the online questions first to give um, you know our friends there who've been um, yeah, following along a chance. Uh, so Cleo, would you be able to share the first question with our panel? So our question that we'll yeah we'll start with is the yeah that's a very good question um, I'm not sure um, we we have interviewed several uh, 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 former staffers uh, of of all th these three organizations um, and they all agreed to be named. Um, and uh, and one uh, retired shortly after the interview, um, and he <laughs> so they're all retired, and I think that's why they agreed to be named. Um, and uh, I don't know exactly what they think because they haven't they, they have seen the the quotes and so on that uh, because we send them to them. But um, 
I'm not sure. I, I think there are some world bankers in the audience uh, at, online. And there is a former OECD uh, employee here, Tom Schiller, who was the head of uh, CHERI, the Center for Education, Research and Innovation. I think Tom maybe wants to say something as well. Um, I think that they, they it, it, it would differ. Uh, there are some that are very uh, open to critical perspectives and looking back at their, at their uh, at their careers, they they also have uh, critical views on on some of the things. Um, and others uh, would would probably um, not agree so much. Um, but I have to say that all in all, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's really uh, World Bank and OECD and UNESCO staff have been very, very forthcoming when it comes to, um, to interviews and things like that. Um, so yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so maybe we'll go to the room now. Um, if we do have any questions from the floor, I'm sure we do. Um, if when you get the microphone, if you can say who you are, um, your question, and then if it's directed to anybody on the panel in particular. I guess I, um, since Marin gave me an opening, I'm Tom Schuller and um, I've actually, like the first, the in, introducer colleague here, I've actually worked for all three organizations, very peripherally for the World Bank, a little bit more for UNESCO, as I, I was the main author of their third global report on adult education. But then I did two stints at OECD, uh, one in the 1970s and one in the noughties as head of CERI. So I'm a, a walking bit of educational OECD history, actually. Um, and I echo very much what Susan said. I mean, um, uh, uh, the, the, very much in line with your, I haven't read the book, but uh, I have read some Marian stuff uh, and I followed the arguments closely. I just had one other bit of Australian influence on OECD, which is of course the highly lobbied appointment of the new Secretary General there. Uh, Matthias Corman uh, from a right-wing Australian background winning over a Swedish woman, which I think will affect the future of the organization. That's a bit beyond the topic here. Uh, can I just make th two, three quick points? One is I think the boundaries issue that uh, you raise is a really interesting one and really important for understanding actually most organizations, but also international organizations. And I think you were quite right to say uh, uh, that CERI was able to, and that's what it was set up to do, to follow a more innovative, as its name implied, the eyes for innovation, and certainly more progressive um, set of ideas, uh, which sometimes did cause internal friction. And I think a very interesting form of micro research would be to look at how those boundaries are maintained, transgressed and the kinds of turbulence that operate. So I think it's a big mistake to think, certainly in the case of OECD, that there's a sort of single ideology that runs throughout all its operations. This is just absolutely not the case. Certainly far less so in the 70s uh, than in the noughties. Um, the second point is actually about um, um, the use made of the information that uh, particularly a technocratic body like OECD provides. And I think, again, there's an interesting set of research there actually as to how information and research is taken up by the countries and used. I mean, one of the more interesting forms of activity we had was country reviews. At the invitation of the country, we would go in with a team of experts and uh, look, there were no financial issues involved. This was purely expertise that they were getting. And of course, the, 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 the question of why the countries invite OECD in to do educational reviews, what they focus on, and then how they use that information is I think one that could, is a very good research topic and also genuinely uh, interesting. Uh, and then my third point, I've got lots more to say, but uh, I better say. The third point, actually, I, I do agree uh, on uh, the PISA, the way in which PISA actually be, was a sort of cuckoo in the nest. It was so successful that it ha did drive out uh, some of the other or OECD, imbalanced, really, the OECD activities. And I think that's probably recognized 
uh, now. Uh, and Andreas is, uh, I mean, Andreas has great strengths, terrific expertise, uh, but it is of a particular kind. Um, I just, for your interest, I've often thought there's a parallel in that respect between PISA and the research assessment exercise in this country. Initially, very healthy activities that forced people to think, well, what do we know about how well uh, we are performing, either as a country uh, education system or as an institutional research operation? And what they should have happened was after two or three rounds, they should have been killed off and had a stake driven through them. But they both grew way, way uh, beyond uh, the level that they should have done and I think turned into sort of Frankensteinian uh, uh, entities. Okay, thanks. Anyway, thanks very much for the, I found the inter uh, evening really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Do you, uh, Marin, do you have any comment to the uh, call to drive a stake through the heart of the... Yeah, <laughs> because I want to give uh, other people also the chance. <laughs> um, I, I, PISA, I think we can, we can all agree that it has, it has been stretched too much. Um, and, and that's what also many people tell me uh, in my interviews, that, uh, that, that, that because, because of the comparativity uh, it has actually stifled, and that's also in the book. It has stifled, uh, uh, yeah, innovative innovation, and 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 it should be, um, yeah. It's it's just grown out of out of proportion and it, and developed a dynamic on its own. And and I also agree with Tom's remarks about uh, that the that OECD is not a single ideology, as you also said, Susan. There's sometimes this, uh, and I'm not free of this either. You know, this this World Bank OECD IMF bad thing. But, but the OECD is, 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 is a lot of different people, a lot of different departments, and, and especially in, in the older days, uh, and, and also with, with uh, different periods of, uh, um, of, of interest and so on. So it's, it's definitely not a single ideology, and that needs to be uh, nuanced more. Yeah, just... Uh, okay, it's on, but it's not. Um, sorry. Um, just a bit of a shout out then to a special issue that both uh, Christiana and Marin are coordinating around um, promissory legitimacy in comparative education. And um, specifically, some of us are focusing on how the institutions actually strategize. How do they deal with a future that arrives and it's now unpleasant and they don't want to? have it tagged to them. Um, and that becomes quite interesting. Um, so, I, and, and so my biggest sense is, and, and you mentioned it's your last comment, I think we've been rabbit in the headlights too much around the OECD PISA. Um, and there's so much more interesting stuff, more complex, and you get more complex analyses actually, if we widen the frame and the theoretical resources um, and the interactions and, and, and so on. So, and I am really pushing a kind of global studies of education in that sense, because you get, if you get caught into, let's say, comparing, it's not as much about comparing, and it's not even international. There's something about the global space that is distinctive. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question uh, from the floor, um, and then there'll be an opportunity to obviously speak with um, all of our panelists over wine and crisps and olives um, in due course, so don't worry. <laughs> I, because I, I wanted to, to make explicit one dimension of this discussion that has been present only implicit, implicitly, and that is largely about us as teachers, those of us who are teachers. So there, I think this book will be a very valuable resource for teaching about these issues. And that, as Susan said, it's not only policy, education policy, but international relations and, and, and so on. And uh, this book is not only a tour de force in terms of scholarship and not only 
in terms of the territory that covers, but also in terms of standards. And some answers is, it doesn't offer. Like, you know, I don't think that you know, the, ans the, the answer to the question, what could have been different, can be answered while maintaining very high standards of, of scholarship here. But still, there is a lot of material for us to use in the classroom. And you know, we will be training not only the researchers of these things, but the policymakers and so on. And I wanted, you know, to speaking of experiences and traumas, to, to bring back very quickly 30 seconds an example. I have taught a course on higher education policies for the Knowledge Society, four sessions about the World Bank, all the criticism, terrible things in Africa, uh, uh, Latin America, not that badly in Central Europe, perhaps not even in the Southeast Asia, but everything was bad. So fine, the fifth uh, lesson, let's play, a role play. I, as teacher, will be the president of the World Bank, and you students, 25 of them from 25 countries, are the research division, education research division of the World Bank, and I am telling you and prepare that I decided to stop discontinue the education research division of the World Bank, forget about uh, rate of return on investment for sure, but human capital, you all say it's bad, let's stop it. Knowledge society, terrible things have happened about it. Stop all this, the bank is a bank, we are not going to be a development agency, so what do you think? And I'm not going to listen anyway because I'm the president of the World Bank and I, I decide, but I'm forced to consult you. None of these students wanted to discontinue the, world, the research education division of the World Bank or for the World Bank to stop being involved in higher education policies. And I will never forget, I really stop here, there was a student from Brazil who was from a favela and you know, was doing wonderful work, came to me after class and said, I would have never imagined myself arguing in favor of the World Bank. But there is something there, and speaking of the very important part of your book about promissory visions. So what happens if the, as OECD does now, moves away from the human capital uh, theory and knowledge society, and they are saying, you know, higher education has failed us. It's not true that it promotes economic advancement, social emancipation, and those, so forget it, forget massification of higher education. So you know, I, I'm saying this because there's a lot of material there that uh, you know, we as teachers need to, need to think about even when the answers are not in the book, but there's a lot of material and this is high level scholarship and engaged scholarship of, of the highest quality. Well, thank you everybody and that draws our our evening um, here, our speakers to a close. I know, Marin, you wanted to say just a few words um, and then, yeah. Yeah, just very briefly, I wanted to thank everybody who was involved in organizing this, Cleo and uh, Susan Robertson and Diego for coming and, and Ellie and everybody else who was involved in this and, uh, and Kings for also funding the open access chapter and, uh, and everybody else. So uh, thank you and everybody for coming, of course. Thank you so much for coming and also the online participants. Thanks very much. Thank you so much.